It's been a while since we looked at one of these on the channel, but when Woz from RMC's Discord, well, when he offered this up for the price of postage only, well, I threw him a few pounds for that, plus a bit extra for beer money, and he sent us one Commodore 64. But it's not just that simple. Yes, it does need a bit of a clean and a new number 8 key, but supposedly it also doesn't work. Now, no screws in the case, and I can see that the top of the case, well, some of the little tabs there that hold it closed, those are broken. But before we worry about any cosmetics, let's see about getting this working. Now, the board in here, it is rather dusty, isn't it? So, first thing we're going to do is let's pull this board out, then we'll give it a quick clean just to take the worst of the dust off it, and we'll plug it in and see if it's doing anything at all. The bit of kitchen roll just helps catch all the dirt. And see us making a mess of my desk. So what do we have? A 1983 Commodore International Commodore 64, assembly number 250407, artwork number 251137, revision B. And so what could possibly be wrong with this? Well, we haven't tested it, we don't even know what the symptoms are yet. But what are these renowned for? Bad RAM, bad PLA, the CIA chips, they like to feel. And I can see some moss branding in here on some of the logic those are renowned to give problems the only sign of rework that i can see on the top here is just at that point on the cassette port it almost looks as if someone has tried to flow solder over the original contacts there presumably they were having connectivity issues and i suppose judging by the state of the user port well, that does look rather tarnished. Anything on the bottom of the board? Um, nothing jumping out to me. I would say all of that is factory. So one fairly unmolested Commodore 64. Let's plug it in and see what it's doing. Yes, I'm just using an original power supply, but it is hooked up via one of these power savers. Just on the off chance this would suddenly die. And we all know when they do that, these things fry. But that should save it from any potential problems. I haven't used this in a while, but it should be okay. Green light, well, that tells us that our 5 volt supply is fine. But what happens when we throw the switch? Well, it is generating a video signal. My SCART to HDMI adapter has picked up on that, but... It's not doing a whole lot else, is it? Black screen. Well, we check the obvious. Are we getting any power? Now, the board has three independent power rails. There is 5 volt provided directly from the PSU. That is serving most of this. But there is a 7805 here and a 7812, providing both 5 volt and 12 volt to the SID and to the VIC. Two. So let's just make sure that we're getting the 5 volt into all of this first of all. That's the supply coming direct from the PSU. We can measure it here on say one of the RAM chips. That is ground up there and then 5 volt at that point. And 4.86, eh, that actually might be a little bit low. Could that possibly be an issue? Little blast of contact cleaner. Let's see if that improves anything. Still does a black screen, but has the voltage come up at all? Yeah, came up a wee bit, 4.9. So, yeah, still a little bit low, but probably fine. What about our two voltage regulators? Ground is always the middle pin. I always get mixed up though on which one's the output. Okay, that's the input, pin 1, 10 volt input, 
and 5.02 output that's fine on the 12 volt yeah 11.88 I'd say that's probably okay as well so it's getting power okay but nothing on the screen let's try this scope so let's take a look around the CPU if I just pull up a pin out of this the 6510 pin 1 that should be the clock board is running powers on it and we do indeed have a clock signal 984 kilohertz yeah I'd say that's close enough certainly not a kick in the backside of it the clock required for a PAL Commodore 64 is 985 plus change so the fact that it's reading 984 here on our 40 pound Aliexpress scope I would say that's fine what about reset that's on pin 40 active low signal and it's yeah, it's sitting high at the minute 4.7 volts that's definitely high enough let's just test it it should start low and then jump up high yeah that's fine so board's coming in a reset it does have a clock signal let's just take a look down the data bus pin 37 down to pin 30 that is data line 0 through 7 that looks okay as does that and that yeah data lines all look fine what about on the address side of things that is from pin 7 down to pin 20 address lines A0 down to A13 a14 and 15 they're on the side of the chip on pins 22 and 23 we'll start with them sure yeah that doesn't quite look right neither does that one a0 looks fine as does one two three dress line six doesn't look right Twelve is definitely not right. Uh, Thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen all look like that. So a Commodore sixty-four that has power, has clock and reset, but its address bus looks a bit screwed up in places, and it's only outputting a black screen. That's going to have to be the PLA. And can we confirm that by looking at the schematics? So over on Zimmers.net, I have pulled up the schematics for Artwork version 251138. Okay, ours is a 37, but you know, same difference. And U17 here, that is the PLA. And on there, we find address lines 12, 13, 14, and 15. Certainly 13, 14, and 15 were three that were showing unusual looking patterns on the oscilloscope. And a Commodore 64 outputting just a black screen only. Well, it is sort of renowned to be the PLA. So let's pull it out and we'll swap it with one from one of my C64s. See if it makes any difference. So let's take that out and we'll fit this socket in its place. As usual, we'll just mix in a little bit of new solder first of all. And then let's see what mood the Moo gun is in today. Is it going to clear these holes for me? That first one, that will need doing again. But the next one, it cleared. As did that one. One chip off with no damage. Let me see if I can get the socket in. Ideally, I'd want to go over that with some wick, you know, solder braid, but I've actually just run out. I am waiting on some more to come, it should be here tomorrow. But if I can get this in, it'll be fine. Let's go with the PLA out of my 64. I know this chip is good. Hook up our video cable and power. And 
What's it doing? We're getting a video signal again, but still a black screen. Let's test the PLA that originally was in this board. This thing. Let's test that in my 64. This is exactly the same revision of board as this one. Does it work? Yes, it does. So it's not that PLA. If it's not going to be that, what else is going to cause a black screen? Well, we know it's not the CPU. I really hope it's not the VIC chip. The VIC in these is always in a socket, isn't it? That one certainly is. As is that one. Let's swap them over. So we'll put that in there. Pick up power and video again. And let's see what this does. Yeah, okay, so that works. That's good. So what else on here would stop this one from working? I've had the board powered up here for about 10 minutes or so. I just want to do a touch test to see if anything is getting unusually warm. Yes, the Logic Probe is also hooked up. We'll come back to that in a minute. But in terms of heat, well, the CPU, the PLA and the SID, they are all nice and toasty, but they get hot anyway. And we know that the PLA, it's fine. Of the three ROM chips, the one in the middle, U4, that's the kernel ROM. There is a fair bit of heat in that. Certainly the other two are cool to touch. That one has a bit of heat in it. Possibly an issue. If there was a bad kernel ROM, this machine may not boot. It may show a black screen. Both CIAs have a little heat in them. And again, I thought they ran cool. But I'm not so sure that a faulty CIA would stop this thing from displaying anything on the screen. Going over all of this stuff down here. Well, all of that is cold. No issues there whatsoever. But the reason that I have the Logic Pro out. Well, there's two chips in particular down here. MOS branded Logic U8. It's an MOS 7707. That is 7406 hex inverter. We can check that very easily with the Logic Pro. Now, why am I wanting to do this? Well, Moss branded Logic, it is renowned for failure. And certainly a failure in U8 that itself can lead to a black screen. So let's take a look. We have Logic High, next pen should be low. It is. Pulsing. That should be pulsing, and it is. Logic low. Should go high, and it does. On this side of the chip, we have a high, so it should be low. A low. Next one should be high. And then another low, and this one should be high. Yep. That chip is fine. This one over here is an MOS... 7711, that is a 74LS139. Slightly more complicated, this is a demultiplexer. But if we take a look at pin 1 on it, well, that is being held high. Pin 1 is the enable pin that should be low to enable this chip. With that high though, the outputs, they should all be high. And those are on pins 4 through 7. 4, that's high. 5. 5 is floating. 6 is high. 7 is high. On the other side of the chip then, pin 15 is another output enable. Active low and it is high again. The outputs on this side are pins 9, 10, 11, 12. So these should all be high. And they are. So that chip 
may or may not be working properly, I suppose, because on this side, output 1 on pin 5, well, that seems to be floating, whereas that should be high. Although, I suppose the real question is, why is that chip not being enabled? Well, if we take a quick look at the schematics, this is our 74139 here. There is pin 1 of it, the output enable for that chip. It is a signal I.O. on the Commodore 64 itself, and that signal is derived from U17, or the PLA. Well, we've already tested that chip, we know that's working fine. But what is U15, or 74 series, what is that actually doing? Well, if we look at the output side of it here, pins 4, 5, 6 and 7. Well, pin 7 just loops back round to the other output enable for the other side of that chip, pin 15. But 4, 5 and 6, that is the VIC, SID and COLOR signals. Those are the chip select lines for those other chips. And if we follow the VIC one here up to the VIC chip, there it is there, chip select active low. So with all of them permanently stuck high coming out of the 139, well, all those other chips are completely isolated from the bus. I think this is why we have a black screen. But taking it back to the PLA, well, as I said, we tested that, we know that's good. But why is that I.O. output why is it stuck high? Well, I found this truth table for the PLA chip itself. PLA stands for Programmable Logic Array. You could almost think of this chip just as like multiple bits of 7.4 series logic all smashed together into the one package. Well, I.O. here, if we look along this, those zeros, well, that would be that signal low. But for that signal to go low, and if I'm reading this correctly, well, any of the conditions above in those columns, they would need to be met. And if we follow all of those up, you can see that in every instance, address line A12, it needs to go high. Now, the reason that I'm focusing in on address line 12 is that if we take a quick look on the board again with the oscilloscope, well, there it is there. It's like a sawtooth type pattern, but it's only peaking to a maximum of, what about, 2.9 volts. That would not be enough, I don't think, for the TTL logic level in here to call that high. If we take a look at the same signal, though, on my other C64 board. Well, there it is there. It is the same sort of sawtooth again, but you can see it occasionally jumping high. There it is. And it's on those high pulses that you can see on the scope that the chip enable pin on the 7.4 logic that it pulses. We're not seeing this activity on the other board. This, I think, is the problem. Here's the question though. What is driving A12? Well, before we do get caught up too much in that, one thing that's really easy to do, I want to pull out this MOS chip and we can test it. We did seem to have that floating output, which should have been high. It may be related to the whole problem in everything, because if we do just take one very quick look with the logic probe again, well, you can see when I first turn this on, There is one flash of activity on that output enable pin just for a split second and then everything dies. So what could be happening here is that this chip is damaged so it's not properly selecting say the SID or the color RAM or the VIC or the CIAs whatever it is and it's not properly selecting them when one of them is meant to be accessing the bus. The CPU is waiting for something that something never comes, the machine crashes before it can display anything on the screen. That's just my theory anyway. Not hard to pull that out. Let's get it out. Let's test it in this. Mm. Mm. 
Okay, I've got the chip in the TL866. Let's test it. 74139. Test. It's bad. One faulty MOS logic chip. So one replacement. Is this going to make the difference? It would be nice to see something on the screen of our C64. Oh yes. Oh yes! <laughs> it's working. It is working. Did we figure it out? Or did we just stumble across it? To be honest, I'm not really sure, but it is a working Commodore 64, or it certainly appears to be anyway. Commodore 64 Basic V2 64K RAM system, 38,911 basic bytes free. That is correct. And it says it's ready. Shall we try dead test? Yeah, looking good. Let's see what this says. CIAs would appear to be correct the two times in the bottom right hand corner there. Those seem to be counting up in uh, synchronization with each other. And we're even getting a sound test. It all sounds fine. So from the dead test point of view, we have one fully working Commodore 64. Let's switch this over to the more thorough diagnostics. And I'll plug in the rest of this harness. Just want to try and tidy up those edge connectors a little bit. We can use a rubber or an eraser for my American viewers. Just go over this gently, that should clean them up. Okay, I think that's it set correctly. Let's try it. Yep. Let's see what this says. Okay, so a couple of things reported bad. U1 and U2, that is the two CIAs. As is 4066 at U28. That's that component. Certainly in terms of the two CIAs, it might just be a bad connection somewhere here. That uh, edge connector there is still looking a bit rough, to be honest. And in terms of the controller ports, well, again, it might just need a bit of a clean. Give all that a clean with contact cleaner and some IPA even, but it's still giving problems. So I think I need to get slightly more aggressive with it. With a fiberglass pen, we'll go over the user port here just to see if we can polish up these pins any. And I think ultimately what I'm gonna to have to do here after cleaning these, because it's gonna be all exposed copper, I'm gonna to have to drag some solder over the top of it. That came up pretty well, and I've done the other side of that one on the cassette port. This top side, though, where a lot of solder has been melted onto it before. Well, the new uh, wick arrived, so let's see if we can just tidy that up a bit. That stuff seems pretty good. It was the cheapest one I could find on Amazon, but it's very soft and seems to absorb really well. So I'm just going to give this a quick going over with the fiberglass pen as well. And then we'll drag some fresh solder over all of these. And it really is just going to be the tiniest bit of solder. I just want to coat this. I don't want big blobs on it like it was before. Now granted that has left some blobs there but We'll just go back over it again with this stuff. And that's the sort of finish that I'm after. Right, that is the ports all cleaned up. So let's plug all this back in and see if that fixed it. Here we go.
Well, the two CIAs are now reported as good, but we're still getting an error at U28. That one, the 4066, that is related to the controller ports. Possibly still an issue then. I suppose we should pull that chip because we can test that as well in the TL866. Okay, let's test it. 4066. And yeah, it is bad. I think that's the first one of those that I've seen bad in the C64. My guess would be someone has plugged in something to one of the controller ports that wasn't compatible. I do have a replacement here. Let's just try this. Yeah, that one tests okay. So that will go in there. And let's try this now. Yeah. Controller port now passes okay. We have one fully working Commodore 64. Okay, the board is back in its case. So let's plug in the keyboard. Because I want to know if that works. And I suppose we'll also plug in the LED. We may as well. I got a replacement number 8 key for it. And yes, all this still does need a really good clean. But I'm conscious this video is starting to drag on a bit. I can come back and always clean it again. But does the keyboard work? Yeah, despite how it looks, this keyboard actually works fine. I half expected some of the keys on this to not work, given the state of it. But no, it seems to be okay. How about we try and load something? SD to IEC hooked up. Load. I can remember how to do this. Comma 8. Comma 1. Isn't that right? And run. Let's go for one of my favourites. Or certainly a game with one of my favourite soundtracks. Last Ninja 3. Doesn't it sound fantastic? As I said, one of my absolute favourite songs coming out of the SID chip. And even the intro itself is pretty cool. But I think that'll do us for this Commodore 64. We have it up and running again. Two faults in the end. The 74139 and that 4066. I suppose I'm just happy that all the customs in there, all they were fine. That PLA on the SID chip, for example, I suppose, especially that SID chip, those are getting quite expensive. So thanks again to Woz for letting me have this just for the couple of pounds that he wanted. The only other thing that I want to do is give the case a bit of a clean, and then this one will go on the shelf and join my collection. But that's it for now. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. 
If you did, I would appreciate a thumbs up. Why not hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Still plenty more yet to come here on CRG. And I'll see you next time.